Honored Speaker Dr. Lifton. Dr. Lifton has spent his professional life analyzing issues that are at the forefront of our society, its past, its present, and its future. After a distinguished teaching career at Harvard and Yale, he is now Distinguished Professor of Psychology and Psychiatry at the City University of New York. He has received seven honorary degrees, including, and one will be forthcoming from the University of Munich. The topics of his interest have been uh, universal. Uh, they have included uh, the most seminal work in our area of concern, thought reform and the psychology of totalism, which will cause we all it. And uh, certainly the issues involved in the cults involve ways in which we do symbolize our world and in which people respond to symbols, however extreme. I'm reminded of a story I just came upon. It's probably a very old one, and I'm, I'm sure you'll, many of you will have heard it. Uh, it's about a sailor who shipwrecked and looks out and see something in the distance, and it seems to be a perfectly formed gallows for hanging. And he shouts, hooray, at last, civilization. <laughs> now that's the first literal example I know of gallows humor. <laughs> my broad concern tonight, as it has been, perhaps fundamentally in all of my work, is with what I call, after Eric Erickson's work, totalism. Totalism. Totalism is really the psychological equivalent of totalitarianism. It's an all or nothing belief system or way of believing certain convictions or certain principles that allows for no alternative. Totalism is an issue, not just with cults in ways that many of you in the audience are familiar, but everywhere as a universal potential. And there are struggles taking place at various levels throughout the world, one can say, between totalism and alternatives to totalism. Look at the strange and sometimes wonderful events we're seeing recently in the Soviet Union and in Poland and Hungary. Broadly speaking, one could describe these events and we see how different applaud the struggles to do that. Or look at a more tragic situation in China. It was in connection with Chinese thought reform that the various people who, who did the early work on this subject, including Jolly West and Margaret Singer and myself and Edgar Schein and a few others, began to look at these questions. But look at what's happened recently. One way of looking at the very moving democracy movement that we saw take shape is a hopeful one, that is, for waves of students in what has to be a second or third generation after the Chinese com communist hegemony and takeover and use of thought reform could emerge so beautifully with a cry for democracy of a very modest kind, simply asking their government to realize what they had promised in their reform movement, shows us that the thought reform programs instituted in the late 40s and early 50s and periodically after that and uh, various versions of them during the Cultural Revolution in the late 60s and early 70s were by no means foolproof. The young in China still sought democracy and still do. When I studied Chinese thought reform, I had the sense that the reformers had over-reformed their population against their own interests. That is, they came in as heroes because the previous regime was totally corrupt and the early guerrilla bands of Chinese communists had been enormously impressive in their achievement. The Long March became a mythic event of the Chinese Communist Revolution. And when they put forward their thought reform programs, they could serve as models who were very impressive to the people exposed to the thought reform. What I say now is that although they announce that they will reinstitute thought reform as the country due to a lot of reasons but including aging leadership who can only remember the glory of the of the long march that revolutionary nostalgia and clamp down tragically on the democracy movement and announce as they have recently that they will reinstitute political study or thought reform very actively i think one can say 
that they cannot fully succeed. Whatever success they have has to be very limited for two very good reasons. One is, the one that I just mentioned, they no longer have that moral power as symbols or as models for people subjected to thought reform, which is crucial for the program if it's to function successfully from the standpoint of the reformers. And second, and this is very important for my message certainly, simply the international communications processes. Certainly a major communications element in the Chinese democracy movement was the fax machine going full steam between Cambridge, Massachusetts and other places and Beijing and other places in China. And those international connections can't be severed completely, nor does the government wish to, and that interrupts what I call milieu control, which is a prerequisite for the thought reform process. Now, all this is not to minimize the tragic and sad outcome for now of the suppression of the democracy movement in China. But I do think it's important that we recognize that none of these thought reform programs are absolutely foolproof. Another dimension of totalism that's worldwide is what I call the universal epidemic of fundamentalism. I'm not going to take the time to go into a series of, differentiation, uh, of, of differentiating all of these di uh, different groups, but fundamentalism really expresses a form of totalism in a religious or political idiom. You can look at what the Chinese did in suppressing the democracy movement as a return to a kind of political fundamentalism. And you can look at not only the, some of the Sunday televangelists, but some of the political and religious movements associated with the moral majority and others in this country. And outside of this country, in the Middle East, Khomeini is a notorious example, but also forms of Jewish fundamentalism in Israel and elsewhere, and in virtually every country and on every continent. And in fundamentalism, there tends to be a nostalgic embrace of a past of perfect harmony that never was in the face of a threatening present. And fundamentalism is in part enormously stimulated by the apocalyptic threats of our time. We're doing a study at the center I've helped to create at City University, Center on Violence and Human Survival, it's called, not surprisingly, I guess, uh, in which we're looking at nuclear imagery in the American self in four different groups. The first group we've been looking at are fundamentalists, and then a group of anti-nuclear activists, a third group of black underclass whom nobody ever talks to about these nuclear issues, and a fourth group we're just beginning on civic leaders. Without going into our findings, there's one rather interesting finding in regard to fundamentalists that is again somewhat hopeful. You know that in some forms of fundamentalism, the theology takes the form of end time thinking in which nuclear holocaust is in a very um, dubious theological way bound up with biblical prophecy, especially in, from the book of Revelation, the New Testament, though there are Old Testament passages in the book of Daniel as well. And the argument in the theology of this end time theology goes that the nuclear holocaust is being sent by God or being permitted by God as a way, as a vehicle for the Armageddon-like struggle and the second coming of Jesus. And of course, there are, this won't be a surprise to what many of you have heard in, in, as expressed in various related ways by different cults. But in our interviews with fundamentalists, we find that the rank and file of people whom we talk to can't fully accept that theology. They know they should if they're to stay fundamentalists in good standing in their various groups. But something about, something closer to the truth of nuclear holocaust has made its way through. And they go through a very painful struggle between their ideological self and their humane self. The humane self being against nuclear holocaust and horrified by it, the ideological self seeing it as necessary, they then become stuck in their own death anxiety because in any of this work, there is a, an interaction of three very important elements. End time, which is originally a mystical notion, 
of realization of the second coming or means of that realization. Nuclear annihilation, which is not just mass death, but a certain kind of total wiping out of humankind and other species. And third, individual death. And because these fundamentalists are unable to harmonize these elements and accept the theology, they're stuck with considerable death anxiety, which they bring to the whole process. Again, a finding of modest hopefulness. To look at these questions, one needs a psychological approach that can allow them to be seen. And in my work from the very beginning, I realize now that everything I've done subsequently was very much in influenced by this first study of Chinese thought reform, even though the subjects have been different and the work has taken different turns. But I've come to a model that moves away from the classical Freudian model or paradigm of instinct and defense. And then as second, I would say, see it as an in-between and very important paradigm of Eric Erickson, that of identity and the life cycle, from which I learned a very great deal, to still a third paradigm of death and the continuity of life, or the symbolization of life and death. And of course, it isn't that one of these paradigms is true and the others are false. That isn't the case at all. It's rather that a particular paradigm is especially important and relevant for a particular moment or era of history. And in our death-haunted century, we need the kind of paradigm that looks at the symbolization of life and death. And in this kind of paradigm, to look at the kinds of issues I've begun to talk about, one needs not only approximate level, which we usually think of in psychological work, immediate emotions and reactions that people have, but one also needs an ultimate level, the symbolization of larger human connectedness, or what I call the symbolization of immortality. And what that means in very, and I would see this as a scientific idea, in our everyday lives, not just when we feel ourselves to be close to death, but all the time as adults, we require a sense of belonging to groups, ideas, processes that are larger than ourselves. And we therefore achieve this sense of symbolized sense of immortality in different modes, through family, the sense of being part of an endless family line, through some religious principle that we see as larger than ourselves and will survive us, um, through our works or a creative mode, which we know are out there and we sense will reverberate. And these can be very modest uh, influences on other people, of teachers, physicians, professionals, working people. Uh, through our attachment to what's called or symbolized in all cultures as eternal nature, which we sense will go on after our limited finite lifespan, or a fifth mode that is rather different from the others but very important, uh, the direct psychological experience of transcendence, the classical mode of the mystics. Uh, one of my arguments in this work is that with nuclear threat and the fear, which is in all of us at some level, of total annihilation of humankind, we have inner doubts about these modes being viable, and that contributes to our increasing hunger for transcendence, often expressed through drugs or through, indeed, some of the cults that we're concerned with. So we must have this larger ultimate mode as well as approximate one, and in the, in, in the proximate dimension, the way that I look at it, just in a simple sense, is to see our way of coming to symbolize the idea of death as starting before we know what that word means, early in childhood from the beginning of life, through experiences of separation, stasis, being held still or being unable to progress, so to speak, or the fear of disintegration. These are what I call death equivalents, and they're also very much at issue in cult behavior. Then, from that standpoint, one can raise questions not only about the immediate psychological behavior of young people and not so young people in cults, always of great importance, but also about larger moral and legal and historical questions which have to serve as the context for these psychological ones. One has to also recognize at all times the potential and actual appeals of cults for people, 
What I learned from studying Chinese thought reform from the very beginning was it's a combination of coercion and exhortation. The exhortation is an appeal, and it has to have some attraction for young people. Coercion of itself wouldn't succeed, or not for long. But it's the combination of the two, and that confuses many people who are unable to see the coercion for the exhortation, so to speak. I think one has to see both. What I'd like to do uh, from here is to re-examine some of the general principles I tried to outline. I guess it's already a quarter of a century ago. It's, it's terrifying when you think in, in those numbers. Uh, <laughs> in a contemporary way and to see where they stand now and how they operate or how they must be modified and then look at some other historical issues that enter into these questions as well. In looking at cults before doing that, uh, it's very important that we keep in mind the issue of totalism as I've suggested and also indeed the issue of civil li liberties. I was talking to some people before dinner and sometimes people have a hard time having a couple of ideas in mind simultaneously. It's very important that we remain concerned about civil liberties at all ends of the cult experience, and at the same time be concerned about totalism. One can, for instance, be uh, enormously critical of totalism, and I confess that I have an allergy to totalism of any kind. I don't like it, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily always illegal or that legal approaches are the only, or even in certain situations, the best approaches. In the end, it's a broad historical question, and educational approaches are very, very crucial. On the other hand, some would-be civil libertarians in defending cults find themselves having to admire that which they defend. I know that cults, like everyone else in our society, has a right to a defense before the law, before courts, but I do think that they should be looked at for what they are rather than uncritically examined by certain groups because they find themselves in the position of defending them. Now, in that way, I think each of us should identify ourselves where he or she stands as one approaches these issues. And I know that in this audience, uh, most of you share my sense of a critical perspective toward totalism. But one has to recognize that and balance some of these dimensions that I've talked about. For instance, uh, when I first studied Chinese thought reform, I began to sense that as horrified as I was by what was being practiced and what I was learning, it wasn't only the Chinese thought reform that I was horrified about, because at that time, and I guess we'll talk about some of these things tomorrow when Margaret and I have this dialogue about the good old times or the bad old times. They were good times because we worked together. They were bad times because of what we were working on. But in any case, uh, I was, when I did my study in Hong Kong, I was interviewing people coming out of China, but I was also meeting people coming from the mainland of the United States talking about McCarthyism of that era, and they were telling horror stories that weren't too different from the ones I heard people describe from the mainland. And so when I came back and I wrote my book about it, I included a series of uh, examinations of other practices where there were elements of thought reform, a thought reform-like behavior, including McCarthyism and including certain aspects of some forms of psychoanalytic training, which I happened to be in at the time, and therefore knew. That didn't sit well with all of my teachers, but you can't please your teachers all the time. But the point really is that one has to look at these issues with a certain amount of universality, and one has to have a certain consistency in terms of one's ethical position about them. In describing uh, the themes that I put forward in chapter 22 of my book on thought reform, uh, that chapter also had a strange and to me uh, interesting and, and mostly very rewarding kind of history because I wrote it mainly about Chinese thought reform but then applied these principles generally and I found that people who had been involved with cults began to read that chapter and it became a kind of underground document, that chapter. I think maybe, maybe it became an underground document because Margaret Singh has been showing it to so many people. But uh, it was really how I became involved in the cult situation because then various parents and, and younger people who had been in cults began to consult with me. I was then at Yale and I would talk with them about the experience and, and, uh, and we would uh, re-examine some of those themes.
In any case, the putting forward of those themes was an effort to do what I just described as being so important, universalize the issue rather than see it as the practice of one particular group alone. The question of cults versus religions is, is never entirely soluble, but you at least have to have your own definition. Some people don't like the term cults, as you know, they want to call them new religions, but I'm comfortable with the word cult if the particular group one is examining, one has to look at them group by group. If it follows three, if it has three characteristics, one is a charismatic leader who becomes increasingly the object of worship, so that decreasingly worshiped are the larger principles, and increasingly worship is the person of that charismatic leader. That's one characteristic. A second characteristic, a series of processes that can be associated with thought reform or coercive persuasion, as Ed Schein called it, or thought reform-like uh, procedures, which I'll talk about in a moment. And a third characteristic is uh, idealism from below, an enormous manipulativeness and exploitation from above. And exploitation can be economic, it can be psychological, it can be sexual, it can take any form. I don't like to use the word brainwashing, but everybody else does, and it, it just won't go away, because the word itself has, has been used for so many things it's lost its meaning. But these characteristics are, uh, I think, uh, present in cults and in thought reform-like procedures. Now, when I was writing about and observing what I could about ideological totalism, the prerequisite, the first principle, and maybe it's the predominant principle that's necessary for everything else, is what I came to call milieu control. And that really means the control of all communication in the environment. And the process in thought reform-like procedures in instituting and maintaining and utilizing the milieu control is to try to deepen and internalize that control in people subjected to the process. So it becomes more and more control over the communication with oneself or within oneself, one's internal communication. And Margaret Singer has some interesting observations on this process in what she calls a second generation of cult behavior, more and more taking shape. But milieu control is necessary for all the other features of thought reform. And in China, the thought reform programs originally were consonant with what was going on in the rest of the society, so that when one, one came out of a thought reform environment, what happened in there was confirmed and reinforced by everything that happened outside of it. That's much less true in China now, if thought reform is carried through. And it's, on the whole, not true in this society, which can make many of the cults islands of totalism in many ways separated and removed from the rest of society and bent on maintaining that separation. But that can intensify their totalism because there's a kind of vicious circle uh, that can be involved. Now, again, it may be that Margaret and others find that in second generation cults, uh, there is a beginning connection that is a little bit troubling between many of the cults and some of the more general uh, groups and processes of society. And, and that is a, a problem. In my recent work with Nazi doctors, I came upon an idea that I now find has, I think, very great relevance for cult problems. And that's the phenomenon I call doubling. I originally observed it in Nazi doctors who very simply functioned in terms of what Nazi doctors did in Auschwitz, which was to be at the center of the killing process through selections and other activities, uh, on the one hand, and yet the same man, they were all men among the group that I interviewed, uh, they would go on leave for three or five days a month from Poland back to Germany and be an ordinary father and husband, the same person. And really what I began to recognize is that there was a separate self-system for each of, those, uh, each of those behaviors. In Auschwitz, there was the Auschwitz self, and for the rest of their experience, there was the prior self, or the relatively more humane self. I also found, although I wasn't studying survivors or prisoners of Auschwitz, but I interviewed many of them in connection with the study, 
that they had to double in Auschwitz. That is, they simply had to deal with and engage in behavior that would have been unacceptable to them in ordinary existence in order to survive in Auschwitz. And that one of the reasons they had so much difficulty in adapting themselves after coming back to wherever they returned was that they had to reinforce the prior self or take a third position, some new reintegration of self, and overcome the doubling. Well, milieu control and cult behavior can produce or can be a major factor in producing the kind of doubling I think we see in people in cults. You form a cult self. The whole doubling phenomenon is, the, the key to it is, the separation of a sense of self that has a, uh, a kind of inclusive function so that the cult self can function for all the needs within the cult. And why is it that there's this phenomenon some have called snapping in which the young person just crosses the table during a law case, sits now with his or her parents on the other side, according to a rule made by the judge, and suddenly is no longer that cult person. It doesn't quite happen that way all the time, or even most of the time, and it's not that absolute. But it's like switching into one's prior self, or out of, in any case, that cult self. And the point is that the self represents an overall constellation. It's not just some little momentary piece of the self. The doubling phenomenon, I think, is very important, and it's, and it's important to think more about in specific relationship to cults. Now, what about the role of technological improvements, and we're in a, an age of technological revolution, in terms of milieu control? On the one hand, one could argue uh, with some, uh, I think, legitimacy that the improvement in technology can certainly uh, render more suffocating milieu control because you can, you can have listening devices, you can use the media in various ways exploitatively, but it's also true, as I suggested, that the fax machine seemed to work in the other direction in regard to China. It's hard to maintain absolute isolation and milieu control. It's a double-edged sword. One has to look at these issues much more specifically than making absolute generalizations of it. The problem for many people, and this is one reason for their susceptibility to the milieu control, as I think about it now in a social sense, is that they're not suffering from an over-controlled milieu during most of their lives, they're suffering from the absence of any structure in their milieu. And they can feel anomi, alienation, and they can at least initially respond very positively to the intensity of that milieu control. They may have second thoughts, as many do, but that can be a source of uh, an attraction. A second fundamental theme that I came upon was what I called mystical manipulation or planned spontaneity. Uh, and you're all familiar with that. I don't have to go through all the ways in which cults do it. Uh, it can be in some traditional religious ways through chanting and fasting and limited sleep, uh, repetition, singing, uh, in ways that seem spontaneous, at least to the newcomer, but are very, very carefully planned and manipulated from above. There is an interesting question about how it works psychologically for the specific charismatic leader of the cult to be present and to be the object of worship. On the one hand, you have a flesh and blood person who can be very appealing, at least while his or her uh, charisma is functional for people in the cult. On the other hand, since that charismatic leader is a fallible human being, his or her uh, contradictions can become seen and can be a source of alienation from the cult. But that's a real factor in terms of how well this mystical manipulation can function or not function. Uh, there is the phenomenon of justification of manipulation of people outside the cult by the well-known phenomenon of heavenly deception, which the moon is used and which is used in other forms or related forms by various other cults. I think the pattern more recently with cults is greater sophistication, trying to uh, be less bald, less direct in their uh, manipulativeness, and more clever, and connect with uh, existing social patterns. Now, 
one aspect of this that one has to consider is what is the effect of our having of our being all of us so subjected right at the heart of society to so many social press pressures or invitations or elements of persuasion whether it's through advertising through certain forms of corporate behavior through certain institutions or bureaucracies it may me it may make many of us more susceptible to that manipulation used to it, expect it, and in a sense uh, less antagonistic to it than one might think. On the other hand, it may turn people very cynical toward it and may give them a certain amount of coding or resistance. But I think we have to always look at uh, the principle here, incidentally, is not to say that advertising is just like thought reform and there's no difference. Of course there's a difference. But you want to look at the pure laboratory form, the very intense or extreme forms of behavior, to understand the more vague, everyday expressions that have some relationship to these extreme forms. I've tried to do that throughout various kinds of work that I've done. Now. A third and fourth set of principles are demand for purity and the cult of confession. Well, the demand for purity, when you look at it, is Sisyphean. You can never become pure enough. And those of you who have been through this understand what, what I'm saying. It is the manipulation of guilt and shame mechanisms, and nothing is more powerful. I've thought a lot about guilt and shame in recent work, and this may be useful to, again, use in looking back at and looking at cult behavior now. In work with anti-war veterans, Vietnam veterans, I came to try to make a distinction between what I called static guilt, what we usually think about as guilt in which there's a mea culpa and self-condemnation that prevents one from uh, developing one's potential or from enjoying much of uh, life experience, as opposed to what I came to call an animating relationship to guilt, in which, with which a number of veterans could criticize or condemn themselves for what they were part of in Vietnam. But that was on the way toward what I came to call the anxiety of responsibility. Guilt can become animating toward assuming responsibility if you can let go of the guilt. Guilt in the direction of responsibility instead of holding on or pressing one into a continuous mire of guilt, which of course is more the pattern of the cults. It's interesting that Freud was concerned that guilt would be the element that might do us in as a civilization because he knew about its harmful effects and the extreme behavior that people are capable of under the influence of guilt, and that still is a very real concern. But there's the opposite concern, too, that in our society of high technology, and especially weapons technology, one can become part of highly dangerous constellations and feel virtually nothing in the way of guilt. So the problem is neither to get to eliminate guilt from our psychological experience, which would be impossible and undesirable, uh, nor to seize upon it and exploit people through it, but rather to recognize it as part of our humanity to be blended with other issues and to be a source, ideally, of responsibility rather than a source of uh, self-condemnation and uh, self-condemnation and, and static behavior. Now, if one then moves to the confession process, uh, which is related to the quest for purity, all groups that try to influence others on a significant scale resort to the confession process. It's as old as humankind. And we can't say that wherever there is a confession, uh, there is therefore thought reform, a thought reform-like behavior. But where the confession process is systematic and is constantly held to a narrow set of ideological principles, and is bound up with an endless quest for purity, then we're in the territory of thought reform. Uh, we do well to return to Camus uh, on these issues, because he said some marvelous things about these confession issues and about totalism in general. I would advise many of you who are interested in these issues to go back and read his book, The Rebel, which is a classic examination of totalism from especially a political but also a religious standpoint uh, as a philosopher rather than a psychologist. Uh, 
Camus wrote that authors of confessions write especially to avoid confession, to tell nothing of what they know. That's rather interesting. What he means is that when you're confessing under coercion, whether it's your own or external coercion, in a way you're falsifying and holding back uh, deeper truths. Camus also said, I practice the profession of penitence to be able to end up as a judge. The more I accuse myself, the more I have a right to judge you. And that's at the heart of cult behavior, I think. Self-accusation as a means of accusing everyone else. But of course, there are people on top of the pile who are uh, doing less of the self-accusation and exploiting those uh, idealists from below who are engaging in most of it. If one then turns to some additional forms of or themes in totalism that I want to at least suggest to you as I did originally and talk about modifications. There are three more, imp uh, three important ones I would lump together. Uh, what I call the sacred science, the loading of the language and the principle of doctrine over person. Well, the sacred science um, is a very important kind of idea because if you look at cult behavior, you're likely to find that even in religions or what are claimed to be religions, there is a claim also to scientific truth of some kind. In the scientific age, you claim objective truth. It was interesting that in my work with Nazi doctors, uh, there was a claim that the killing of the Jews emerged from a set of scientific principles which they attributed to the physical anthropology highly modified of their time, genetics and eugenics and a few other principles. The science was nonsense, but it was a claim to science. And in nuclear strategy, and there is a cult of nuclearism as well, uh, there is the claim of scientific principles about the fighting of nuclear war when nobody has ever fought a nuclear war in which both sides had nuclear weapons and nobody knows anything about it, really, and yet there's the claim to scientific data. You must make a claim to science in any cult that you're part of, and I think even the smaller cults make those claims if you look for it. Now, if you look further, in terms of uh, the loading of the language, language is an extremely important part, uh, and I think it's, a, it's an area of further study that could be very useful in engaging the cult issue. Study the language very carefully. It isn't only that there are the rote terms, of course there are those, but there are also terms that have enormous appeal and can sum up a whole set of emotions satisfactorily and, in fact, very powerfully for young people, at least at a certain phase in their lives, and can indeed help young people in a phase of depression or a sense of being lost to at least a temporary sense of revitalization. The language has all of those elements. Now, the principle of doctrine over person is obvious, uh, and it really means that as soon as one begins to have doubts that arise from one's own direct experience, one sees evidence of the charismatic leader's less than perfect behavior, one sees evidence that contradicts claims of the cult or even exposes lies that one has been subjected to, doctrine over person, and this is true of all totalistic ideology, requires that you reject the personal experience in favor of the truth of the doctrine. And that is a key element which every totalistic ideology depends upon. It really is at the heart of totalistic ideology and it has to be recognized and looked at. One reason why young people may be susceptible to this sacred science, combining religion and science, the loading of the language, and, um, and the principle of doctrine over person is that they live in such a confused relationship to truth, to science, about which everybody has become in some way ambivalent, and to where you might find truth. Really, a confused relationship between self and world. And these exaggerated simplifications, what 
uh, Lionel Trillin once called the thought terminating cliche, which is really the language of non thought, can have tremendous appeal amidst that confusion though the appeal can be temporary, and that's where the various counseling of people on their way out of cults becomes so extremely important. Now, the final of these eight points, I think I've been getting in all of them, though going through them rather quickly, because I want to just sort of lay out a certain series of principles. I can't cover everything, uh, even when you're cosmic. But, <laughs> But the, the last and, and ultimate and dangerous principle is that of really uh, assuming the right to grant or remove from people the right to existence, or what I call the dispensing of, exi of existence. If you believe, as a group, that you have the ultimate truth, and more important in this Manichaean division, ultimate good as opposed to ultimate evil, the next logical step is to believe that you have the right to decide who has earned existence and who has no right to existence, to dispense existence. In most behavior that we're familiar with among people in this room, that dispensing of existence has been symbolic. If you're dismissed from a cult, you're, you're supposed to undergo a certain kind of death because life exists only within the cult. Or you can be ostracized and you can be condemned to a life of sinfulness or to drown in your own evil or whatever phrase may be used. Well, that can be painful enough when people are under that kind of psychological and religious or pseudo-religious influence. But in certain political situations, as you well know, involving the Nazis or the uh, Chinese communists or the Soviet communists in earlier days, the dispensing of existence has become literal. And people were put to death because it was decided that they had no right to existence, having the wrong ideological position. The Nazis, and especially the Nazi doctors, had a chilling phrase for this which was actually created by, as you might expect, a psychiatrist and a great lawyer, even before the Nazis came into being. <laughs> life unworthy of life. Life unworthy of life. And that had to do with various um, hereditary aberrations originally, but of course it was spread into various uh, political areas, and various groups that were so designated as life unworthy of life were killed first in the so-called euthanasia, in quotes, program of the Nazis, and the Nazi doctors in particular, uh, which mainly meant the mass murder of mental patients, and then in the genocide that followed, uh, mainly Jews, but also Poles and Russians and uh, other groups, homosexuals, Seventh-day Adventists, and other groups as well. Life unworthy of life. When one looks at these issues, one has to look at the larger society. And I want you always to be asking these questions, even outside of the cults, from what we learned from studying the cults. Is there a kind of life unworthy of life process going on at the heart of our society, in the way that we treat the underclass, the homeless? Are they designated as life unworthy of life? Or how else can you look at it? in terms of what is offered or not offered to them, and the way in which their situation in society is accepted, at least to the point of doing nothing to alter it, by programs or the absence of programs uh, from the top on down. So these issues, moral, psychological, and historical, aren't limited to the cults or to the Nazis or the communists. They are questions that we have to look at at home. Now, if one looks at the issue of dispensing of existence, it takes on a process that Eric Erickson called pseudo-speciation, in which we of the human species treat members of our fellow species as though they belong to a different species and we're not human beings. And of course, that's done all the time by different groups, by certain national groups or religious groups, and certainly uh, among cults. And that becomes a societal issue in every sense.
Well, just to make a few re remarks about some of these additional, those are, the, those are the ways in which I think these original themes that I tried to delineate so many years ago still seem all too relevant. I wish they were much less relevant now, but some of the things I said are a way of bringing them up to date or connecting them with things that one sees right now. I mentioned that we have to think historically about these issues, and in my work I've looked at what I call shared themes, shared historical or psychohistorical themes, themes of behavior that one can find in certain people or groups that have to do with larger historical processes. And I think that there are three very fundamental historical processes taking place which one can look at in very simplified terms uh, as being behind some of the cult formation and some other things that I want to mention. One is what I call historical or psychohistorical dislocation. A second is the media revolution. I'll talk about each a little bit. And a third is the, uh, the threat of extinction. Now, by, psych by historical dislocation or psychohistorical dislocation, I really mean a loss of intimate contact and a fluid response to the fundamental symbol systems that in the past have guided lives, symbols of authority, of religion, the whole uh, demarcation of the life cycle. Of course, we still have these symbols and rituals, but we have increasing difficulty of inwardly accepting them. And we have vast dislocations that have dominated much of the 20th century and I think uh, have been uh, uh, exacerbated during the period from the end of the Second World War. In this sense, incidentally, in recent, the cults that we talk about and these totalistic movements are, can be seen as both radical and reactionary. They are often radical critics of real faults in our society. And they do look at various issues of hypocrisy, sometimes very tellingly. And of course, they're deeply reactionary in their authority structure and in their control of other human beings and really suppressing the whole set of notions uh, that we've developed about individuation ever since at least the time of the uh, Renaissance, a kind of internal fascism. I think there's a kind of pendulum swing back and forth between cult formation and fundamentalism on the one hand and what I call the protean style, which seems to be the opposite on the other hand. But, and these are responses to the dislocation I'm describing. By the protean style, I mean the experimental style of the self, of trying out various groups, involvements, ideas, uh, symbol systems. We saw a lot of this during the 60s, and it's still around. And being able to surrender one's particular involvement for another one, not entirely, and not entirely without psychological cost, but with much less psychological cost, than would have occurred 50 or 100 years ago. The protean style has to do with dislocation, and I think that we see swings, pendulum swings, back and forth, and they're in some ways two sides of the same coin between a quest for totalism and proteanism, and proteanism having its problems with diffusion, and totalism having its problems that you know all too well. If you look at the khomeini rushti confrontation, for instance, you can see that as a confrontation between totalism and proteanism. Khomeini being an, or was an arch-totalist and fundamentalist, religiously and politically, and Rushdi a very self-conscious protean artist who wanted to undermine, proteanism involves the mocking of sacred cows and sacred beliefs, both of them coming from Islamic culture and, of course, hitting an impasse. And we will see many more of such impasses because these are two very prominent patterns going on in our larger historical uh, moment. And look at the preoccupation recently with the American flag, again, close to home. Uh, what is going on with the American flag? Well, briefly, one can say that uh, Everybody's entitled to be upset by abuse of the flag if we honor it as a symbol. You don't have to like what people do. But to see it as a form of sacrilegious behavior or blasphemy is to create a cult around the flag. And that's 
And of course, to combine that with certain political machinations, as we're seeing happening in Washington, it's not limited to one party. But we should be aware of that kind of process and learn uh, and be, perhaps become wiser politically in what we learn from cults, where we see these things in more intense or pure form. Now, uh, in addition to the historical dislocation that I've mentioned, which is so germane to the protean style, I mentioned also the mass media revolution. We don't pay enough attention to the mass media revolution. To some extent, it has served the cults, and to some extent, it undermines them in ways that I suggested, but it's a very powerful process. Khomeini won over his population through cassettes that were sent to uh, Iran long in advance of him, and which won over the population for the Khomeini movement. Uh, the mass media revolution now allows any of us at any time to have at his or her um, uh, beck and call virtually any image from the present or the entire human cultural past through television or radio or other media. That is a radically new situation. And in that sense, we have to uh, re-examine McLuhan, who told us some very wise things, but who didn't apply the psychological dimension to this uh, media examination that he made. Now, uh, and of course that contributes to the proteism that I mentioned before. The third dimension has to do with the imagery of extermination or extinction. It's very hard to gauge what that imagery does to us, but what I can say, and I think now we have increasing evidence from various studies that have been done, especially with children, but also with adults, that virtually everybody in this culture, I would say from the age of four, maybe earlier, has some kind of image of the possibility of extinction from something. He or she may not know it's nuclear weapons at an early age, but there's something in the air that comes through the media about that possibility. What that seems to create is a combination of what I call fear and futurelessness. Fear about all kinds of annihilation, but futurelessness, doubts about all those modes that I mentioned of symbolic immortality, a larger human connectedness, because who can be sure of living on in one's children or works or eternal nature should there be use of those nuclear weapons, which we know can destroy everything. And again, it's in response to that radical fear of futurelessness that we find so much intensity uh, in the embrace of uh, transcendent experiences, high states. And one of the sources of cult appeal that has been neglected is the constant offering of high states, which they indeed do. High states have been available in all cultures, and I think we suffer in most late industrial cultures from insufficient opportunity for the experience of transcendence, whether it's in a spiritual mode or through everyday behavior, sexual behavior, athletic behavior, uh, the contemplation of beauty in softer tones. These are all potential experiences of transcendence. Uh, the combination of their relative absence uh, in our culture, as well as the threat of extinction and the doubt under which the other modes of larger human connectedness uh, are thrown, contributes to, I think, the appeal of the cults because they offer high states and immortality systems of their own. That sounds abstract when I talk about it this way, but it's very vivid and important when you get down to the nitty-gritty of uh, talking to people who have come out of these experiences. In that sense, the cults provide a kind of initiation rite for young people, a very severe experience which may be valued for its severity, and then one can move into what's a version of adulthood which involves those high states. And part of the attraction to the cult can be something like an addiction to the high states, which you then need and don't want to give up and see as being uh, divested of should you leave the cult. Well, these, I think, are some of the larger historical questions uh, I have to say, as a psychiatrist, and I started out somewhere along the line as a clinician, uh, that these aren't all, in any sense, as you can tell, psychiatric or pure psychological problems. They are broad social problems. It 
may be that what we, as those of us who are clinicians, and there are many in this room I know, can most do is, of course, help people, but also provide, use our specialties to provide knowledge and education. I think that real education that gets to these psychological dimensions, as well as to the larger historical ones, can serve very well and reach a very large audience. Finally, my final resting place on this uh, cosmic journey uh, is a piece of good news, which I'll introduce with a saying of Voltaire. Uh, Voltaire said, if this is the best of all possible worlds, what then are the others? <laughs> well, the other that I want to leave you with is what I call the species self, species consciousness, species awareness. And I'm happy to report that this phenomenon is gradually and erratically taking shape. Just to describe it to you very briefly, in working on nuclear weapons questions and also on questions of Nazi behavior, um, I came to recognize this imagery of extinction that I mentioned and what that does to people when they take it in. Once one takes in the truth of that imagery of extinction as a possibility, including the whole potential truth of nuclear winter, the lowering of the temperature and really the destruction of all life, as a possibility should the weapons be used, then one recognizes what I call shared fate. That really means that I say to my Soviet counterpart, and he or she to me, and now we're saying this happily to each other more and more, if I die, you die. If you survive, I survive shared fate going quite beyond any kind of ideology. In that sense, the very threat posed by our weapons and other apocalyptic threats to our environment and resources that we find in our world now propels us toward this kind of species consciousness. And it is indeed possible, and more and more people are forming an actual sense of self that can be observed psychologically which still retains the immediate identities that we have. I mean, I would still remain a psychiatrist and a Jew and a professor and an avid tennis player and a few more things, but all of them subsumed to my sense of being a human being with much in common with all other human beings. And that means I can feel pain, as I'm sure uh, you can also, if somebody is arrested in Czechoslovakia because he or she is a dissident or tortured in a South African jail because you happen to be black. Uh, a fellow human being is undergoing suffering. More and more of this kind of sense of self, or at least of this dimension, is being formed in relationship to more and more of, uh, more and more people in regard to this sense of self. Now, there are terrible forms of opposition to the species self, and the very idea of it terrifies many people. Khomeini put out his call to murder Rushdie at a time when there were some gestures from those who were relatively more moderate in his government trying to rejoin the human species, to emerge from fundamentalism. So the image of species thinking or species consciousness can be a war cry to the fundamentalist. But then there's another dimension too. In fundamentalism, the beginning impulse can be a species one. That is, there can be some notion of a path that everybody should take. The problem is, the insistence is that it be my path. <laughs> so that fundamentalism, once it becomes that, immediately polarizes and does the very opposite and stands in opposition to this kind of species uh, development. But I would suggest to you that uh, with it all, uh, it could w very well be that the species idea is one whose time, if it has not come, at least is, uh, is here in terms of crucial need, because pragmatically we know it's necessary. Historically, we see it taking shape more and more. In an evolutionary sense, it can be seen as an evolutionary form of progress of the self that is required for survival. One shouldn't expect this to occur automatically. We have to work at it. You won't find the greening of the species, so to speak, as used to be said about America, some automatic process. But in our position and from what we learn, each of us in various ways can do a great deal to uh, help it along. And I see myself 
as a professional, both trying to describe it as accurately as I can, which is my task as a professional, and as a human being committed to helping it, uh, trying to do just that. Let me close um, with a statement of hope uh, that comes from Gershom Sholem, which is a sort of message that he has, he, as you know, was a great student of Jewish mysticism, which leaves everything open and leaves everything possible in terms of uh, human realization in the future. And Sholem wrote, the story is not ended. It has not yet become history. And the secret life it holds may break out tomorrow in you or in me. Thank you very much. to express our thanks to you tonight and the honor that we feel at, at hearing you, the real, really seminal thinker in this field that we've all followed all these years, uh, and yet your exposition and your future thinking and your ongoing uh, thought processes through the whole movement, the whole elaboration to the applications of society, we can't thank you enough. We really, thank you. really thank you.